Acts 3.21 says, For he must remain in heaven until the time for the final restoration of all things, as God promised long ago through his holy prophets. Welcome to three nights of power packed teaching on the final restoration with our visionary Bishop Sean Till, brought to you by the House of Prayer Everywhere in Oakland, California. These teachings will be intensive and on subject matter that is not highly exposed. You will receive keys of knowledge. This will be an eye opening time for the serious seeker. This evening's teaching will be the restoration of kingdom power. I am your moderator, Servant Carolyn Jacob. Let's open with a word of prayer. Gracious God, our Father, we bless you this evening and praise your name. We give you glory. We give you honor. Hallelujah. We thank you, Lord God, for this day that you made. We are still rejoicing and we are glad. We give you praise, Father God, for this brand new month, the first day of the last month in 2021. You have been faithful to us. Your mercy has been good to us. You have covered us, Father God, from day one all the way to this time and opportunity. You've given us another chance to say thank you. With a grateful heart, we say thank you. With an uplifted heart, we say thank you. It is by you that we live, move, and have our being. We thank you, Lord God, for your peace right now. We thank you for your grace over us this moment. We thank you, Father God, for setting our atmospheres wherever we are, Father God. We pray you will saturate this line like never before. Let your word run with a free course this evening. Open our ears and our hearts to receive your word, Father God, that we need to hear right now. We thank you, Lord God, for this opportunity, time, and chance that you've allowed us to come together around this altar. We give you praise, Father God, for the word that's forthcoming. We give you praise for your word of God that is life and it's already settled in the heavens. We give you praise for the man servant, Bishop Chantil, your servant, your son. We pray in Jesus' name, Father God, you will hold him up on every side. Keep his heart encouraged, oh God, as he walks through this word. We know he, he has labored in this word and doctrine. We give you praise, Father God, for his stewardship and his passion and zeal for your word. We pray in Jesus' name that you will bless this time that we have. Set this atmosphere, Father God, let your spirit reign in this house. Let your spirit rule on this line. Hallelujah and glory to you. And we give you praise, Father God, for doing all things well this day. We give you praise, Father God. We enter your gates with thanksgiving and your courts with praise. We are so thankful and we are grateful unto you. The only living God, the only breathing God, our Father. We give you praise, Father God, for your mighty works tonight, Father God. Open our ears and our hearts to receive your word. Let your word, Father God, just have a free course this evening. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we pray, and we thank you for it all. And we say amen, amen, and amen. Hallelujah. We will now have mu music ministry by the House Trio.
Hallelujah. Bishop Kill, we are ready for the teaching of the final restoration. Oh, I'm listening to Carol and Jacob. Bless the Lord. Uh, I think I've got you live. You're going to have to mute, I think. So <laughs> glory to God. Uh, blessing and praise the Lord that we are with God. With him. Uh, yes. <laughs> I have no control over it. Let me mute everybody. Okay. Unmute your phone again. Okay. Oh, Take care, E. Unmute. I'm muted. Yes, you're good. Praise him. Thank you, Pastor. That was sorry. executive. I'm sorry for all of that. Well, bless him. That was executive pastor Anita Latin working behind the scenes with the media ministry. And thank you, moderator Carolyn Jacob, as always, for being anointed and prepared for intercession and moderation. We look forward to you coming back and finishing ministry with us this evening. We are always very grateful for the smile and for the spirit that you bring to every assignment. I want to welcome you. It, it is a Wednesday. It's a word Wednesday, but we know that it is the first day of a new month. And usually on the first day of a new month, I would be gathering with a smaller group called the Apostolic Cloud. And I share with them um, teachings that I don't normally or have the opportunity to uh, share widely or publicly, but I do get that opportunity to express those things with them. And we talk about vision and I get into some things, moments of transparency. And so we do that use on the first day of every month. And today uh, I am uh, just launching what I believe the Holy Spirit has given to us for these next three days. As you have heard, we're going to be in the teaching of of the final restoration. I'll be very honest with you. Usually I'm not so nervous. I have a little, I'm a little nervous tonight and I'm excited about it because I think that is a good indication of what the Holy Spirit is going to do. I have no template for this. I don't have uh, a, a teaching I've done on this before that I grabbed and brought in. Everything I'll be teaching and sharing with you over these next three nights have just been time spent with the Father. That's all it is. It's just time spent with the Father in prayer and in the Word. So we're getting ready to get into the Word, and we're going to get into the next three nights, and I hope that you'll have the opportunity to stay with us. Now, if you're watching by YouTube, YouTube or Facebook or Zoom, I need you right now to go ahead and if you can like, go ahead and like. If you can share, go ahead and share. And if you can subscribe, would you go ahead and subscribe? If you can do either one of those three, would you do that now? Would you like it somewhere? If it says like, go ahead and like. That means something. It's going to help us. And if you see share, go ahead and share. Tonight will become global, exponential, international because you share. And then if you can subscribe, go ahead and subscribe. And if you have not done so, don't do it now if you have to leave this portal. But I want you to make sure that you subscribe to the House Network on YouTube. And we'll make sure we keep you connected. It also, the house has launched its own portal, and that is the house network .online church. And we'll make sure we post that in the chat. You'll have that link, and you'll be able uh, to subscribe. Also, I believe, yes, you can subscribe. I'm not, maybe that's not the term, but you can go ahead and join or subscribe uh, to the house network .online church, and the media team will make sure that you have that information. Now, during the these three nights, I will not be doing a grace giving appeal. I'm not going to do any kind of special appeal for an offering. So you need to be mature, hear the word. If the word blesses you, sow into the ministry. Um, that's it. That's all you need to do. Just sow into the ministry. The Bible says that when you hear the teaching of the word of God, when you sow in response to teaching, the Bible says you're not sowing to the preacher, you're not sowing to the church, you're sowing to the spirit. 
How powerful is that? I love that. If you have never read that, you need to go to Galatians chapter six and, you know, between verses six and 12, verses six through 12, you should read that and let that bless you. Anytime you hear the word of God and respond to the word of God financially, the Bible says you are sowing to the spirit. So if you don't hear me do a special appeal, it's not Bishop forgot again to get the offering. No, I didn't forget. I'm doing what the Holy Spirit has led me to do. You'll be taught the word. If you're blessed by the word, You'll respond to the word. The media team will have all the portals open for you. The only thing you have to do is have a willingness. And if you're willing, then you'll follow through. Okay, so we'll do that. And that will be our protocol for the next three nights. Now, of course, you know, I got a lot to cover. So let's get into this word. I'm prayed up. You're prayed up. And if you weren't prayed up after that prayer with moderator Jacob, you ought to be prayed up. (laughs) Glory to God. Let's get into this word. Go with me to Acts chapter the third. And I'm going to pick up at verse 19, Acts chapter 3 and verse 19. Acts chapter 3 and verse 19. I think I may be getting some background noise. Acts chapter, I am getting some background noise. Acts chapter 3 and verse 19. I'm going to read it in the New New Living Translation, the NLT. That's what we're going to do. We're going to start at the NLT, all right? Now repent of your sins and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped away. Then times of refreshment will come from the presence of the Lord, and he will again send you Jesus, your appointed Messiah. Verse 21. For he, your appointed Messiah, Jesus, must remain in heaven until the time for the final restoration of all things as God promised long ago through his holy prophets. Now let's get into the focus. Verse 21 again. For he, Jesus the Messiah, He, Jesus the Christ, he, Jesus the exalted one who now sits at the right hand of all majesty and power, he must remain in heaven, be held up in heaven. He must remain in heaven. He must be held up in heaven until the time for the final restoration of all things as God promised King James says, as God has spoken, as God promised long ago through his holy prophet. So number one, what we need to understand is this, God's end time plan, and I'm giving you my proposition early because I really want you to hold on to this. God's end time plan is to bring believers back to his best. God's end time plan is to bring believers back to his best. God has a best. It's called glory. And God in these last of the last days is bringing believers back to his best. Now, why does God want to bring believers back to his best? Acts 3.21, because Jesus must remain in heaven until the time for the restoration of all things. Now, let's make sure we're clear what it means when it says the restoration of all things. The restoration of all things, listen, is not the doctrine of inclusion. Peter in Acts chapter three is speaking. He is not promoting universalism. He is not suggesting that everybody is ultimately gonna be restored back to God. Everyone in all the creation will wind up back into redemption. That is not what he's teaching. There are people who teach that everybody is gonna wind up in heaven. It's called the doctrine of inclusion. There are some who will teach that when it says all things are going to be restored, it includes Lucifer. That is not true. Say, well, how do you know all things doesn't include that? 
Look at the King James Version, Acts chapter 3, verse 21. Whom the heaven must receive, decomai, hold, until the times of restitution, restoration of all things, listen, comma, after the word things in my King James, there's a comma, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets, which means that the restoration of all things is only the things that God has spoken. The restoration of all things is the restoration of the things that God has spoken. Is there anywhere in the word of God where it is spoken that Lucifer will wind up back over the choir? No. Is there anywhere in the Bible that God spoke that you can reject him, reject his son, reject his spirit, and still live in eternity with him in the new Jerusalem, abiding in his glory? No, that is not in the word of God. So the restoration of all things is not literally all things. The restoration of all things are all the things that the Lord has already promised. Are you here? It's the restoration of the things that God has already promised. So there are things that God has promised and those things need to be restored. And the things that God has promised that need to be restored have to be restored before Jesus can return. What did you just say? <laughs> The rapture is certain, yes. The rapture is credible, yes. The rapture is conditional. What did you say? The rapture is conditional. What would be the condition for the rapture? Peter says the restoration of all things that God has promised. So there are things that God has promised that have not yet been restored in the earth realm. And until those things get restored, the rapture will not be released. I'm telling you by the authority of God's word, there are things that have to be restored before you, child of God, can be raptured and get up out of here. And we'll talk about that in a moment. But let me give this to you because Peter talks about the final restoration. Now in, well, let me say it like this. Well, let me, I'll just say it like this. There is such a thing as progressive revelation get this in your notes. Progressive revelation. Just get that term in your notes. Progressive revelation. What is progressive revelation? Progre progressive revelation is the idea that God's word walks. <laughs> there is progressive revelation. God's word walks. And we know that to be true because we read about it in the Garden of Eden that the word came walking, looking for Adam and Eve. God's word walks. What is that? Progressive revelation. Simply means this, that God does not give it all to you at the first. There is first revelation. Then there will be a further revelation. And then there will be a final revelation. So if I were studying, um, say grace, I'm studying the doctrine of grace, I would go and look for the first time grace was ever used in scripture. And then I would go and look for where grace is further mentioned in scripture. And then I would go and look for the final time that grace is ever used in scripture. That will give me an idea of progressive revelation. First, further, final. There is a first restoration, there is a further restoration, and there is a final restoration. Peter's talking about the final restoration. The further restoration would have been the restoration of God's covenant with Israel. That would be the further restoration. The final restoration is God's restoration with the church. 
That's the final restoration. That's what Peter is talking about. And then there is the further restoration, and that would be when God restores Israel. But then there is the first restoration, and the first restoration is what you would call creation. I don't have time to deal with this tonight, but there is um, what I would call gap theology. Some call it the gap theory. It's not a theory. It's a theology. Genesis 1 and 1. In fact, go, go ahead and look at it. Let's look at it. Genesis 1 and 1. I know you know it, but let's look at it. Genesis 1 and 1. Genesis 1 and 1. I'm going to show you that this is the first restoration. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. That's a summary statement. That's a summary statement. The first statement in scripture is a wide summary scripture. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. That's a summary. Now look at verse two. And the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep and the spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Now here's what we know, that God did not create an earth that didn't have form. We know that God did not create an earth that was void. We know God didn't create a heaven that had darkness all over it. We know that's not what God did. When it said in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, it's not describing verse two. That's not what God created. We know something happened between verse one and verse two. What happened between verse one and verse two is the fall of Lucifer. What happens between Genesis 1 and 1 and Genesis 1 and 2 is the fall of Lucifer. Don't have time to get into it, but you should look for Isaiah chapter 14. You should look at Ezekiel chapter 28. If you read Isaiah chapter 14, if you read Ezekiel chapter 28, it, it, it will give you revelation on the fall of Lucifer. So Genesis 1 and 1 is creation. The fall of Lucifer happens between Genesis 1 and 1 and Genesis 1 and 2. So Genesis 1 and 2 begins what? A restoration. So what we call creation on our side is actually a restoration because God now has an earth that has no form. He has an earth that has no, it's void. He has an earth that has darkness upon it. And now the spirit of the Lord is moving upon the face of those waters. And why is the spirit of the Lord moving over those waters? It is for the purpose of restoration. So there is the first restoration that you just read about, Genesis 1 and 1, is a restoration. And then there is a further restoration that is with the nation of Israel that you will see in the old covenant. And then there is the restoration of the new creation, that is the restoration of the church, the restoration of the body of believers. And we must experience restoration in this hour. Because if we do not experience restoration in this hour, listen, we are holding up heaven. What did you just say? <laughs> he must remain in heaven until the final restoration of all things. Get this in your notes. Restoration must happen before the rapture. Now, nobody taught me that. Restoration must happen before the rapture. Who knew? Restoration must happen before the rapture. There will be no rapture until there is the restoration of final things. Now, let me show you something real quick. Go to Romans chapter eight. We're on our way to first Thessalonians. Go to Romans chapter the eighth. Romans eight. Let this bless you. Romans 8. The Apostle Paul is talking about future glory of the believer. Listen to what he says. I'm in Romans chapter 8. I'm just going to read verse 19. Romans chapter 8 and verse 19. In fact, let me. Um, I want to make sure I read it. From this translation. Romans chapter 8 and verse 19. Here it is. For the creature eagerly waits, listen to this, for the revelation of the sons of God. <laughs> 
King James Version. For the earnest expectation of the creation waited for the manifestation, the revelation of the children of God. The children of God cannot be in full manifestation without a restoration. The children of God cannot be in full revelation without a restoration. We cannot be fully manifested. We cannot be fully revealed until we've been fully restored. I'll say it again. We cannot be fully manifested. We cannot be fully revealed until we have been fully restored. There has to be a final restoration before the rapture happens. God is going to do something in the body of Christ before the groom returns to the bride. I'm gonna say this, it's gonna sound a little crass, but hold on, because you need to know this truth. Jesus is not a pedophile. Jesus is not marrying a little girl. <laughs> His bride is going to be mature. His bride is going to be holy and without the blemish. His bride is going to be without the wrinkles, without the stains. How will that ever be possible? There will be, and this hour it has begun, the restoration of all things. The restoration of God's bride, the restoration of the church is happening in this hour right now. Whether you understand that, whether you've been a part of it or not, you just need to know that there is a restoration going on in the spirit realm manifesting among a remnant of people because God God is preparing the bride. He's preparing his body for his second coming. Go with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter the fourth. 1 Thessalonians chapter four. 1 Thessalonians chapter four. Uh, I'm gonna pick up at verse 16. 1 Thessalonians chapter four, verse 16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God and the dead and Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together. That's the rapture. The word rapture is not in the Bible, but this is the idea of rapture, caught up together. Then we who are alive and remain shall be raptured, caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Now notice the Lord does not put his foot on the earth. He descends, but he stays in the atmosphere. He descends, but he never comes down and puts his foot on earth because that will be in the millennial. That's the millennial reign, Revelation chapter 20. That's not the rapture. In the rapture, he never puts his foot on the earth. In the rapture, he comes in the air and then catches us up together to meet him in the air. Now, when we return in Revelation chapter 19, we'll be returning with him, glory to God, like soldiers following a commander in chief. Oh, what a glorious day that will be. Now, he says this, verse 17, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Now, again, what did Peter say? Peter said that the Lord Jesus, your Christ and Messiah, must, I didn't put that word in the Bible, Peter put that there, must, that's what the Holy Spirit said, must remain in heaven until the final restoration of all things. Now, what do you see? The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. Now, if Jesus descends from heaven with a shout, it means that the final restoration of all things was completed because Peter said he's gonna remain in heaven until the restoration happens. There has to be restoration before there is rapture. Go with me to 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4. 
And I'm going to try to watch my time. First Peter chapter four, go to first Peter chapter four. It's a scripture you've read before, but let's look at it with fresh eyes. First Peter chapter four, I'm going to verse 17. For the time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first began at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? Now, you might want to mark that. I know you don't want to, but you need to highlight it. <laughs> I know you ain't trying to get to that verse, but you need to hear that verse. The body of Christ needs to hear this verse. Now, listen to what he said. He says, for it's time for the judgment to begin at the house of God. The judgment begins at the house of God. Now, the word judgment here. It is decrees, it's decrees, but it is not just a decree, it is a forensic decree. Now get that. The word judgment that Peter is using here is judgment in a forensic sense. Forensic sense. I watch forensic files. I, I, I watch it probably too much. I watch forensic files. That's one of the things I do. If I get a down day, I'm going to try to um, watch me some forensic files. What do they call it when you just sit there and watch stuff? Uh, binge. If I'm ever going to binge, like TV binge, I'll probably binge it on something like forensic files. Now watch this. When it is forensic, when it's forensic, what they're doing is they're going through every possible evidentiary process. If there is something to be found, they will find it. If there's some DNA in the room, they are in that room because in a forensic sense, they want to locate what the crime has been. They want to locate what the offense has been. They come in forensically because they want to search out what has happened here. When Peter says judgment, is going to begin at the house of God. What he's saying is that the body of Christ is going to go through forensics. The body of Christ has to go through a forensic sense of judgment. This is not judgment like wrath. This is not judgment like punishment. This is judgment like someone discerning you. This is judgment like someone looking into you and examining you and discovering what really makes you tick. This is judgment in a forensic sense. And this is what's happening in the body of Christ. Paul says that every time we hear the word of God, it ought to be washing us like water. That's what he says about being the bride. We ought to be getting washed by water. And it's the water of God's word. And so forensically, every time we hear the word of God, the word of God comes in and begins like a sharp two-edged sword, discerning the thoughts and the intents and begins to go in and discover what the crime is, the, the very thing that needs to be corrected, the very thing that needs to be changed. Listen, the thing that needs to be restored. So why would judgment begin at the house of God? Because restoration begins at the house of God. And we have to know what we have to be restored from, restored to, restored of, but we've got to be restored. There is a final restoration of all things. And the final restoration of all things has to begin with the people of God. And as we come into restoration and as principles of the kingdom of God and precepts of the kingdom of God get restored, it puts Jesus in that place where he is closer than he's ever been before. We have to experience restoration before we experience rapture. Now, let me work on this. Go with me to Revelation chapter three. Go with me to Revelation chapter three. I just want to make this point. Revelation chapter three. Revelation chapter the third. Now, again, it's a scripture we've heard before, but let's make sure we understand it. Now, there are seven churches mentioned in the book of Revelation. The letters are written to the angels. The angels are the 
uh, set men and women. They are the pastors of the local congregations. Now, Laodicea is the last church that gets a letter. Laodicea is the last church to get the letter. Now, Jesus is not going to come back for the Laodicean church. The Laodicean church, go with me, go with me. I'm in verse 14, Revelation chapter three. Go with me, come on. It's the last book in the Bible, come on. Revelation chapter three, verse 14, the seventh church, say seventh. The seventh church, say seventh. The seventh church is the church at Laodicea. But Jesus makes it clear that he is not gonna return for the church of Laodicea. Watch this. To the angel of the church in Laodicea write the following. This is the solemn pronouncement of the amen, the faithful and true witness, the originator of God's creation. <laughs> I know your works. You're neither cold nor hot. I would that you were cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew you out of my mouth. Now, he is not saying, I'm coming back for you. No, he's saying, I'm going to reject you. you. You're about to be rejected. I'm going to vomit you. That's the Greek. I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. I'm going to vomit you out of my body. <laughs> okay, stay with me. Because you say, watch what they say, I am rich and increased with goods, have need of nothing, and you don't know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Now, child of God, look at me. Look, look, no, no, look at me. Do you really think that Jesus is coming back for a church that's wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked? Do you really think he came and died? to get a bride and he's gonna come back for a bride that is wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked? Is that what you think of your Christ? Is that what you think about the bridegroom? That he died, shedded blood, is sitting in heaven and can't wait to come back and get a wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked church. Jesus says, no, I'm not coming back for you. I'm going to spew you, spit you out of my body. Listen to what he says. I counsel you to buy of me gold tried in the fire that you may be rich, white raiment that thou mayest be clothed and that the shame of your nakedness do not appear. Anoint your eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. Three things in verse 18 I want you to pay attention to. Three things in verse 18, Revelation 318. These three things I need you to pay attention to. Jesus says, Here's what you need to do. If you want me <laughs> to return to you, here's what you need to do. Number one, he says, you need to buy of me gold tried in the fire. What is he saying? He's saying, number one is, you need to change your values. You need to change your values. Jesus says, my counsel to you is buy of me. In other words, stop putting your investment and your resources in things other than knowing me. Oh, doesn't the body of Christ need to hear that tonight? Jesus says, I want to counsel you. I'm giving you some good advice. Buy of me gold tried in the fire. That would be refined without alloys, without impurities, without dross. Jesus says, you need to change your value. What the church believes is important has to be restored. What Jesus calls priority has to be restored. Our sense of value. What we think is most important, what we think is costly, what we think is priceless, that has to change. Jesus said, I'm not coming back for the wretched, poor, blind, naked, miserable church. I am not. I'm telling you, if you want to see me return, then you need to change your values, but not only change your values, but then you need to change your virtues. Listen to what he says. He says, you need to put on white raiment and get rid of the shame there is shame. There is shame. And the shame is that your sin is exposed. Remember this, child of God. Guilt 
is what you deal with internally. Shame is what you deal with externally. People bring shame. Your own sin brings guilt. You can walk around with guilt all day and not be ashamed. But the minute somebody finds out about your guilt, then you go into shame. He's talking about virtue. He's talking about living right. He's talking about righteousness. The white garment that he's putting on, that's righteousness. That's holy virtue. That's having a sense of moral and ethical excellence. Where is that in the body of Christ? Be careful, Bishop. Now, here's a third thing. Vision. He says, I need you to check your values. I need you to check your virtues. And then I need you to check your vision. You need better vision. Listen to what he says. He says, you need to anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see what's going on in the body of Christ. What is the one thing right now that the body of Christ truly needs? It needs a restoration of vision. So how do you know that? Because the Bible says where there is no vision, the people perish, they cast off restraint. They just do whatever they want to do. They live wild. They live wild when there's no vision. There needs to be vision. Jesus says to the last church, the Laodicean church, I'm not returning for the church you're doing. I'm not coming back for that. I'm not coming back for that. You're going to have to do some changing. You're going to get restored before I return. Now watch what he says. Verse 19, verse 19, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, be zealous therefore, and repent. Look at me, child of God, look at me. They taught you that the last word that Jesus had to the church was go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. It's not so. The last word that Jesus gave to the church was not in Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20. The great commission is not the last word that Jesus has for the church. The last word for the church is not go. The last word for the church is repent. (laughs) All right, I'm gonna read it again. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, be zealous therefore and repent. The word repent is used in the book of Revelation seven times. Put that in your notes. The word repent is used in the book of Revelation seven times. How do you know that? How do you think I know that? (laughs) The word repent is used in the book of Revelation perfectly, completely seven times. Jesus is calling the church back to repent. Why do we need to repent? Because if we don't repent, we can't be restored. If we're not restored, we can't be manifested fully. We can't be revealed fully. We'll still be like the church in Laodicea. We'll still be sitting around here, wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. That's not who we're supposed to be. That's not who Jesus is coming back for. Look at this, verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice, and open the door, I will come into him and sup with him and he with me. Listen, we gave this scripture to the sinner and it never belonged to the sinner. <laughs> we made this the altar call scripture. It's not the altar call scripture unless you're calling the church back to repentance and restoration. This is not the scripture you use to tell the sinner that he needs to come to Christ, that Jesus is standing and knocking at the door of your heart. This is not that scripture. No, this scripture, Jesus is not talking to sinners. He's not talking to the world. He's talking to the saints. What happened? They put him out his own church. Jesus is standing outside of the church at Laodicea and says, I'm knocking. And if I can get somebody in there, in the church, in my body to open up the door, I will come in and I'll restore relationship. I will sup with him and he'll sup with me. We'll be back in the covenant. You'll be living in full restoration. That's why he says, I need you to repent because I can't come back for a church that looks like you. That's why I need you to come back and get your mind right. 
because that's what repentance is. It's the change of mind. Repentance is not you crying and snotting because you feel bad about what you did last night. You ought to feel bad about what you did, but that's not repentance. Godly sorrow will lead to repentance, but godly sorrow is not repentance. Repentance is when you change your mind. I need you right now. If you're near anybody, just tell them I changed my mind. I'm not, I'm not going to preach, but you ought to tell somebody right now, I changed my mind. I'm about to be restored in everything that God has promised because I'm going to change my mind. Peter says, if you will repent, the times of refreshing would come on you. Literally, the times of your life would change if you would change your mind. You want the times to change, but you don't want your mind to change. Peter says, if you change your mind, you change your times. Huh. Go, at, go back with me to Acts chapter three. <laughs> I hope you heard what I just said to you. I'm gonna show it to you again. Go back to Acts chapter three. Go back to Acts chapter three. Oh, oh. give me 10 minutes. Give me 10 minutes. That's all I need. Give me 10 minutes. Don't go anywhere. Give me 10 more minutes. All right, Acts chapter three. Now watch this. Repent. I'm in verse 19. Repent, be converted, that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Literally, here's how it reads. So that the times of refreshing may come. Repent so that the times of refreshing may come. Change your mind and you change your times. If you don't like the times in which you are living, change your mind. Because when you change your mind, everything in your times begins to shift. I got to move on. The restoration of kingdom power. We'll stop here tonight on this turn. The restoration of kingdom power. Now, just um, let, let, me, let me say this. The kingdom of God is real and is being restored. The kingdom of God is real and the kingdom of God is being restored. When Jesus came into the earth, he had a kingdom focus. If this is not in your notes, put this somewhere in your notes. Jesus only used the word church in the gospels three times. Jesus used the word church in the gospels three times. He uses the term kingdom singularly no less than 78 times. It's more in the gospel than seven days, but I mean, just quoting Jesus without parallel text, at least 78 times he used the term kingdom. Now, what do you think was on his mind? <laughs> what do you think was really on the mind of Jesus? We talk church, Jesus talked kingdom. You know what the church is supposed to be? Some of you heard this teaching before. The church is supposed to be kingdom college. The church is supposed to be kingdom college. The church is supposed to be preparing God's people for kingdom living. We're supposed to be taking you through subject matters and disciplines to get you ready to live this thing called kingdom. Before the rapture, the doctrine of the kingdom, the gospel of the kingdom must return and be restored to the body of Christ. You need to start hearing kingdom. And you're not just hearing kingdom because it's a popular term or kingdom because it looks good on a flyer. You want to be in the presence of people who are kingdom conscious. Jesus says this in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 10. Matthew 6 and 10. Matthew 6 and 10 comes before Matthew 6, 33. Matthew 6 and 10. Jesus teaching us to pray. What did he tell us to pray? Matthew 6 and 10, you know this already. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. 
Three things I want you to remember coming out of that verse. Matthew 6 and 10, three things remember coming out of that verse. Matthew 6 and 10, three things I want you to remember about the kingdom of God coming out of that one verse. Matthew 6 and 10. Number one, you should learn, according to Matthew 6 and 10, out of the mouth of Jesus, that the kingdom exists. The kingdom exists. It's not some ethereal other world reality. You're not gonna die one day and go to the kingdom. No, you have to be in the kingdom right now. Eternal life doesn't start the day you die. Eternal life starts the day you get saved. The kingdom of God doesn't start the day you die. The kingdom of God starts the day you got saved. Why did Jesus tell Nicodemus you must be born again? So you can go to heaven. That's not what he said. Yeah, you need to be born again so you can go to heaven. That's not what he said. <laughs> Jesus told Nicodemus, John chapter three, don't have time to take you there. Jesus told Nicodemus in John chapter three, you need to be born again so you can see the kingdom of God. And then he comes back and says, you need to be born again so you can enter into the kingdom of God. You need to be born again because it's a reality you can't even perceive until you're born again. You need to be born again so you can enter into the kingdom. And what does Paul say? Romans 14 and 17. What is the kingdom? Righteousness, peace, joy in the Holy Ghost. You don't wait to die to get that. You have that now. It's a present possession of the believer. So the kingdom of God, according to Jesus, Matthew 6 and 10, the kingdom of God exists. Jesus stood in front of Pilate and said, my kingdom is not of this world. The kingdom exists. Jesus came and said, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom exists. Number two, according to Matthew 6 and 10, not only does the kingdom exist, the kingdom expands. The kingdom exists but the kingdom expands. Jesus says there is a kingdom, but he also says it's a kingdom that's coming. <laughs> it's a kingdom that's growing. It's a kingdom that's on the increase. It's a kingdom that expands. Every time somebody gets saved, the kingdom expands. Every time you get a revelation of God's purpose in the earth for your life, the kingdom expands. Every time you are a witness for what God is doing in the world, you become an expansion of the kingdom. That's why I want you to like that's why I want you to share. That's why I want you to subscribe because every time you like, every time you subscribe, every time you share, the kingdom expands. The kingdom exists, yes. The kingdom expands, yes. The kingdom expresses, yes. The kingdom exists, thy kingdom. It's God's kingdom because it's his, we know it exists. Thy kingdom come. It expands. It's an ever-growing, ever-coming, ever-increasing kingdom. And then he says, the kingdom that is to come will have your will done where? On earth as it is in heaven. So what is the kingdom? The kingdom is the expression. Get this in your notes. The kingdom of God is the expression of God's dominion. The kingdom of God is God's expression of God's dominion. The kingdom of God is God's expression of God's dominion. When the kingdom comes, it comes in order to announce God rules here. God reigns here. God has dominion here. God has a domain here. When it is the kingdom of God, it is an expression of dominion. Now listen to this, go with me. Matthew 24, 14, and we close. Matthew chapter 24 and verse 14. You got to be back tomorrow night. I'm going to leave you with no excuse. <laughs> Go with me. Listen to this. Matthew chapter 24. I need to get there. Verse 14. Watch this. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then the end shall come. Why are you not marking that in your Bible? I'm going to tell you tonight when the end shall come. The end shall come 
at the restoration of all things. The end shall come when the gospel of the kingdom has been restored. Oh, you better do something with that because I got to get out of here. The kingdom of God, <laughs> the gospel of the kingdom, the gospel of the kingdom, the gospel of the kingdom, the gospel of the kingdom has to be restored in the earth before Jesus raptures the body of Christ. Listen to what Jesus says. Jesus said, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world, inhabited earth as a testimony to all nations. And then chronologically, and then the end will come. Now you know when the end will come. Now, how will the end come when you and I don't hear anything about the gospel of the kingdom? The gospel of the kingdom has to be restored. Jesus came into the world and he came in as king. On Calvary, he was crowned and that cross became his throne. And now he is seated in the right hand of all power, having been resurrected into life. And he says the end will not come until the gospel of the kingdom has been restored. And what is the gospel of the kingdom? And I can only give this to you in cliff notes because I'm over my time. The gospel of the kingdom, listen, is not the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. The gospel of the kingdom is not the death, burial, or resurrection of Jesus. The gospel of Christ is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. It's not the gospel of the kingdom. I said, Bishop, please. <laughs> I can't help. I got to tell you the truth. Romans 1.16 is a reference to the gospel of Christ. Go look at it when you get a chance. When Paul says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, it is the power of God under salvation, he's talking about the gospel of Christ. He says it in the previous verse. It's the gospel of Christ. The gospel of the anointed one is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. But here's the problem in the body of Christ. We think that the gospel is only the weekend. We preach the weekend of Jesus as if that is the whole story. It's not. The gospel of the kingdom has to be preached in all the earth. And that is not the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. Bishop, are you saying we shouldn't be teaching? You know I'm not saying that. Of course I'm still preaching the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. But I know what that is. It's the gospel of Christ. I'm not talking to you about the gospel of Christ. I'm talking to you about the gospel of the kingdom. Jesus did not say, then this gospel of Christ must be preached in all the earth before the end shall come. No, he said the gospel of the kingdom has to be preached before the end can come. So we need the restoration of the gospel of the kingdom. I need five more minutes. I got, I just need five more minutes. I'm not going to ask you for nothing else. I just need five more minutes. Go with me to Matthew chapter four. I got to show you this. You're already in Matthew. Go to Matthew chapter four. I just want to prove it to you. because You got that look on your face. Matthew chapter four. Let me get there. Let me get there. Uh, Matthew chapter, oh, Matthew chapter four. Look at verse 23. <clears throat> Excuse me. Matthew chapter four, verse 23. Listen. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching what? You're going to make us read it. I'm going to make you read it. Preaching what? The gospel of the kingdom and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. You still in Matthew? Go to chapter nine. What did Jesus preach? The gospel of the kingdom. Go to Matthew chapter nine. Look at verse 35. Let every word be established. Let every word be established. Let every word be established. Then Jesus went throughout all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom and healing every kind of sickness and disease. Huh? Jesus preached the gospel of the kingdom. And he was not preaching his death, burial, and resurrection. 
So well, how do you know? He wasn't preaching his death, his burial, and his resurrection because when he told the disciples that he was going to be raised from the dead, they looked at him and they spent the rest of the day trying to figure out what did he mean by being raised from the dead. So you know he's not going to the villages of Galilee preaching death, burial, and resurrection, and his own disciples can't understand that. He was not preaching his own death, burial, and resurrection. When it says that Jesus was preaching the gospel of the kingdom, what was he preaching? Here it is. I got four more minutes. He was preaching the good news of dominion. Oh, you better do something with that, and I'm out for the night. The gospel of the kingdom is the good news of dominion. <laughs> the gospel of the kingdom equals the good news of dominion. I'm trying to help you with your notes. The gospel of the kingdom is the good news of dominion. And so in these last days, before we get raptured up out of here, what should the body of Christ be preaching? We should be declaring the good news of Christ's dominion. He is king, and he is not king later. He's king now. He is king of kings and lord of lords, and he's not waiting to get a crown. He's already been crowned. He's already sitting in the greatest diadem of all power. He's at the right hand of all majesty. Why are we preaching the dominion of Jesus? We still preaching Jesus like he's just a, a bellhop. We preaching Jesus like he's a glorified Santa Claus. We preaching Jesus like he's a celestial concierge. We preach Jesus like he's just the one to come to bring you some healing and bring you a blessing. And you know, if you get in trouble, the only thing you got to do is call that Jesus. That's not the gospel of the kingdom. You need to pray and get Jesus in your heart before you die and go to hell. That's not the gospel of the kingdom. The good news of the kingdom is that God has placed his flag in the earth. Oh, calm down, man of God. The good news of the kingdom is that we are attached, we are connected, and we are anointed to the one who has all power, and we should be declaring in this hour his dominion. Put it in your notes. Declare the dominion. Put it in your notes. I'm out. Psalm 145. I'm out. I'm over my time. I'm out. Psalm 145. Psalm 145. If you are part of the house, you know, you know Psalm 145. Psalm 145, look at verse 13. Look at verse 13. Thy kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and thy dominion endureth throughout all generations. You can't talk about kingdom and not talk about dominion. Go to Daniel chapter 7. Kingdom and dominion go together. The good news of the kingdom is the good news of dominion. What is the kingdom of God? It's the expression of his dominion. In this hour, we need to be preaching Jesus and declaring Jesus having rule and reign in this hour. Instead of just preaching that Jesus is the one that's going to come in and just be my little helper and he's going to be, you know, fix my little problems. No, Jesus does all of that. Yes, glory to God. But that's only one part of the gospel. There's another gospel and the good news of the kingdom is for the body of Christ to start preaching and declaring that our Christ, the one whom we have given our hearts to, he has all power, not the White House, not the United Nations. The good news of the kingdom is not he's just coming back again, but when he comes back, he's coming back with all power. Look at this. What did I tell you to go? Daniel chapter, Daniel chapter 7. Let me get there. I didn't got excited. Look at this. Uh, what verses? Verse 14. Watch this. I'm just reading. I'm reading. I'm just reading. There was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which that which shall not be destroyed. Why are we not preaching that? Why are we not preaching that? Why are you not hearing that? Look at verse 22, Look, verse 22, verse 22. Until the ancient of days came and judgment was given to the saints of the most high and the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. 
Now, if we possess the kingdom, we possess the dominion. Look at verse 27. And the kingdom and dominion. Kingdom and dominion. You can't have kingdom and not have dominion. And kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the most high, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. And all dominion shall serve and obey him. That's what we got to preach. That's what we got to preach in this hour. That's the gospel that has to be preached in all of the world. Hitherto is the end of the matter. Good Lord. Hitherto, come down, man. Ah, I'm closing. Hitherto is the end of the matter. What is the end of the matter? Look at verse 27. And the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the most high. He is giving you the kingdom. He's giving us the dominion. And he says, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and all dominion shall serve and obey him. Hitherto is the end of the matter. This is the conclusion of the matter. It's not a conclusion until you're in dominion. I'm out. It's not in conclusion until you are in dominion. I'm out. I can't stop. I can't do anything else. The gospel of the kingdom has to be restored. And you, new creation believer, have been brought into this hour because the Lord wants you to possess the kingdom and possess the dominion. And we, children of God, are sitting here in one of the most pivotal, crucial times in human history. Do you understand that? We're in the last of the last days. The end times are upon us. The conclusion is coming. The matter is about to be concluded, but it will not be concluded without the restoration of what God promised. And that for you personally, I know you're looking for something personal tonight. I'm sorry I didn't have much for you personally, but I hope you are enlarged by revelation. But personally, here's what you know. The enemy cannot win until God has restored to you all that's been promised. So if you are right now holding on to a promise and you haven't seen that promise fulfilled yet, you keep holding on to that promise because the promise of God is going to be fulfilled in your life. He will restore all things which he has promised, which he has spoken. If you know tonight, you are not in his best and you don't wanna go another night without being restored to his best, I'm gonna lead you in a prayer. If you've never prayed to receive the Lord Jesus Christ, this prayer is for you. If you have prayed, saved on your way to heaven, you already know your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. This prayer is also for you. It is a prayer for the restoration of all the things that the Lord has promised so we can get the release so that Jesus must not remain in the heaven any longer, that there will be a release and a revelation of Jesus in our lives like never before. I want you to pray with me tonight if you want to get back to God's best. Somehow you slipped away from your prayer regimen. Come on, let's get back to God's best. You're not giving and sowing like you used to. Come on, let's get back to God's best. You're not living in holiness like you were raised, like you know you're supposed to. Come on, let's get back to God's best. You haven't been studying this word like you're supposed to have been studying this word. All right, okay, don't feel bad about it. Don't beat yourself up about it. Just come on back and come on back to God's best. Hallelujah. Let's pray. And if you want to come back to God's best, just pray this prayer with me tonight. Dear God in heaven, I call you Father. I thank you for the grace. I receive the grace of restoration. Bring me back to your best. You have come to me. In this word tonight, I believe I receive. And so I thank you 
that you raised Jesus from the dead for my restoration. I thank you that your grace is sufficient to bring me back to your best. I confess I have sinned. I confess I need to return. I repent. I change my mind and I come back to your dominion, your rule, and your reign. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen, amen, and amen. If you prayed that prayer or a prayer, something aiming in that direction, I believe the Holy Spirit led you for that. And I believe right now that if you started something fresh, you're going to need help and support to continue to carry forward what the Lord started in you tonight. I want to keep teaching you about the good news of the kingdom. I want you to know that you have possessed the kingdom of God and you're walking in a dominion. And that's the one thing the enemy does not want you to know nor believe that you have dominion. So tonight, if you want to continue to learn, to grow, to mature in this decision that you made tonight, reach out to this ministry. We love, we pray, we connect, and we serve. We would love to connect with you. Just go to info, I-N-F-O, at itsthehope.org and find one of those portals uh, somewhere near you right now. If you are again with us on any portal that will let you like, please like. If you find a button near you that says share, please share. If you're looking at something that says subscribe, please go ahead and subscribe. And remember, the house network.online.church has been launched. <laughs> Glory to God and wait to see what the Lord is going to do with that. And that's a network that will be committed to declaring the dominion of God in this hour. God is not sitting off in the corner somewhere just watching things happen. No, our God is in the earth right now expressing his dominion. And how does he bring the expression of that dominion? He brings it through the body of Christ. So you be restored, child of God. Tonight, you be restored. Come back tomorrow night, precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little, there a little. I'm turning it back over to moderator Carolyn Jacob. I think we're going to have maybe a roll call or something like that. So don't go anywhere. We want to hear from you. Moderator Jacob, turning it back over to you. Blessing, uh, do I have audio? You do. You hear me? Yes, sir. Okay, praise him. Uh, is Moderator Jacob still online? Uh, I need somebody to tell me what to do next. <laughs> hey, man, can you hear me now? Oh, yeah, glory to God. Thank you. Oh, glory to God. We were, thank you for, <laughs> <I'm giggling. laughs> thank you, men of God. We received that word in the name of Jesus. Thank you for the release of that on time, up close, and personal word of God and for your labor in that word. Hallelujah. We will now open the line for a prayer request, a praise report, or a shout out for the teaching that was released in our hearing. Additional prayer requests should be sent to www.prayereverywhere.org. Intercessors are ready to touch and agree with your prayer request. If you're on your phone, just press star six to unmute your phone. If you're on the computer, of course, just press unmute. Um, Ms. Roll Call, please share. Glory to God, this servant Marilyn Daniels calling from Antioch, California, and Jonathan Bean, he's here with me. And I just thank and praise God. Today is my birthday and I praise and thank God. I have a praise report. Thank you, Bishop, for such a wonderful teaching. I thank you all for all your prayers. Continue to pray for the Beans, Whitehurst, and Daniels that we might grow strong in the Lord. But my praise report is that on the 24th, I filled out an application 
to work for Unitech. I've been waiting for this to happen for five years. I'm training to get my BS in in nursing and they're paying me to do it. And I'm just so thankful. I'm so grateful that uh, the Lord is doing what he's doing in our lives. And I just can't thank you for all your prayers and God bless you tonight. Amen. Happy birthday to serving Marilyn Daniels, the ancestor who knows of God, Dunamis Power. Thank you for sharing this evening. We give God praise. And thank you for joining with uh, joining with um, joining Mr. Jonathan Bean for joining this evening. We, can you say increase on your life, Marilyn Daniels? <laughs> can you say increase? Increase for bringing back the my praise mind. God is so <laughs> good. Hallelujah. Let me shout, Amen. <laughs> Glory to God. Thank you, woman of God, for sharing and that praise report. We give God praise. Uh, Ms. Roll Call, please share. Oh, bless the Lord, oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. This is Mother Ponder calling from Sacramento, California. Tonight, I should say listening, and thank you, thank you, Bishop, so much for that great teaching. I just thank God that I was able to get in. I am on the phone. I couldn't get in on um, Facebook, otherwise, but that's okay. I didn't miss a thing, and I'm just thankful and grateful to God to be able to be with you tonight and to hear this teaching. And if the Lord says the same, I will be on tomorrow night and also the next night to get all three of these lessons. Love you, saints, and be blessed, and to God be the glory.